fantastic discussion around the biology, and I think we, we've really been hitting the, these key points as for how we're thinking about prognosis in this group of patients. Why don't we use that as a segue to, to, to then turn our attention to the actual treatment of these acute leukemia patients. So let's first start with really the discussion of induction. You know, you've got that, that patient in front of you, they've been diagnosed with, with their acute leukemia, and we're deciding how we're going to be treating them initially. And we know that that's, that's a very different scenario from our end as opposed to the, the patient that's already further down the journey. Clearly, it can be a complex journey. Have they relapsed? Are they refractory? Are they going to transplant? But let's start with the induction part. So Elias, from your perspective, first, let's think about the prognostic factors. We've discussed a bunch of them, but in terms of that, then no, you know, that first time we're, we're seeing that patient, what are the key prognostic factors you want to know about and that you're going to really have back in a short enough amount of time to really sure. act on sure. for therapy? Well, let's start with what's emergent, what's urgent to do, and then we can go. Uh, first, come, I get the referral, coming somebody with acute leukemia, rule out APL. That is emergent, DIC, you have to get pot test, ATRA, uh, 15, 17 translocation, PMR, alpha rearrangement. Done that, five hours later, pot test is negative, you don't have feature of DIC, cool down, done. You get the karyotype done. Uh, CBF leukemia, A21 inverse 16, or something else. A21 inverse 16, induction, high dose RSC. Studies have shown high dose RSC is the must to be given. Now, we want to discuss the myelotic, gentuzumab, azagamycin is not in the market. At least in this subset of patients, using myelotic has been helpful. So, therefore, high dose RSC is the must for this patient. Tell me, mentioned sick kit as uh, bad features. Treatment-wise, there's no implication for therapy to add ticket inhibitor up front, maybe in a relapse. Transplant, have a donor, question mark, but keep a close eye on that. And then you get to the vast majority of your patients where you have either deployed or bad features. Uh, Raphael eloquently mentioned the NPM1 and other classifications, so we have to do the molecular panel, NGS, or whatever you do, and get in mind what you have for these patients. But then you divide them by fit for chemotherapy, unfit for chemotherapy. Fit for chemotherapy are 60 years and younger, they don't have renal failure, they're in good shape. Usually we tie them for a transplant to have a donor. And you go for high dose RSC induction. Now the question in the USA, three plus seven or high dose RSC? I come from MD Anderson, where we published multiple paper and meta analysis showing high dose RSC is to be given for deployed good feature patients. Now somebody with bad feature high dose RSC may not play a good role. Uh, and then consolidation, plus or minus transplantation. If you have a donor, bad feature, responding or not responding. Unfit patients, chemotherapy, I mean, in the randomized trial, at least from the cytobine and azacitidine, at least we don't have a great CR rate, and it's changing the dogma of leukemia treatment where CR is the best to get survival. Now, we're not killing them by chemotherapy, but the cytobine or aza has been the standard of care in the US, in Europe for these patients. It's not enough. We know despite the best treatments we have today, relapses are still happening. And I think, as you mentioned at the beginning, this patient should be referred to people with expertise, where clinical trials are available, with the aim to improve uh, the overall survival and the response rate for these patients. So, so let's break it into different pieces. You raise, raise a, a variety of, of key parts. First, that, that kind of key decision point regarding, you know, am I really going to go down an induction path uh, or am I going to go through a lower intensity path? And realizing, you know, at all of our institutions, we might have very specific protocols that, that affect that. But thinking more to kind of, you know, the standard, you know, approach for, for, for individuals who don't have access to studies. Rafa, you, at your center, in your experiences, you're trying to have that sort of litmus test of, you know, are you going down an induction path or a non-induction path? You know, what are the features you, you, you consider? Are there any hard stops you have in between them? It's really individualized. I think Elias mentioned all the risk factors that put people into different categories, but still for the most part, patients with AML get treated with seven plus three. What we do down the road, depending on their response, I think is where, where things begin to diverge. The clinical trial piece I think is very important, and not only in relapse refractory patients or patients with difficult features, but really at any level. I think mm -hmm. our treatments for AML aren't so great that we can't find newer, better ones. I think, I think, yeah, I think first thing we always look at the age, although as we learn more about this, it's really age is function. So it's really a good, almost a geriatric assessment for the patient, their performance status, their activities of daily living, presence of any geriatric syndromes. So we are try, trying to treat, to decide on that. In younger patients, I think it's very clear that 
almost all the patients, unless there is really a major comorbidity, they will get intensive chemotherapy. I think the challenge is more in older patients. So one is, what do you define as older? I think most of the studies, when they looked at AML outcome, looked at age of 60 or 65, but we know in practice that that's changing. We see patients in their 70s that are very fit. So I think, you know, you look at the patient, their comorbidities, their performance status, uh, and those are keys in deciding intensive chemotherapy or not. I would like to you know, bring the attention that patients with AML, even older patients, definitely do benefit from treatment. And that had been you know, shown in several studies that a treatment is better than no treatment. The question we are looking at is what type of treatment. And today, I think realistically, if we don't have a clinical trial, you are looking at an intensive chemotherapy approach versus a hypomethylating agent in, in, as a standard treatment for those patients. So if patients are fit, no major comorbidities, I think intensive chemotherapy, even on older patients, offer them benefit. If patients have comorbidities or unfit, I think nowadays we go for uh, you know, less intensive chemotherapy. Sometimes the disease features, like the cytogenetics, may also dictate that choice. So in an older patient that have poor risk cytogenetic, with the current standard available therapy, like 3 plus 7, the chances of going into remission are very low, and especially if that's not going to be followed by allogeneic stem cell transplant, one would question the value of intensive chemotherapy. So if somebody is older, poor risk cytogenetics, one may go for less intense chemotherapy because of that.